It's a joy to be with you this morning. I am grateful for Dr. Forney stepping in for me last Sunday. I called him at 9 p.m. Saturday night and said, Bob, I don't think I'm going to be able to preach. I've never done that to anyone before, but if there was one guy I could do it to, it was Bob. So thank you, Bob. It was a great gift to have to be able to go to you like that. This morning, um, I'm going to ask you to stay where you are. I'm going to read a passage to you. And uh, we're not putting it up on the screen. You've been standing for some time, but I want you to pay attention to the Word of God. And if you have your Bible, <clears throat> turn with me. There are two separate passages linked, and, and you'll see the linkage, I'm sure, after I begin. But the first is Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. Luke 10, 38 through 42. This is Jesus and his disciples are traveling. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. The Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. And then going on from there to the Gospel of John, the 11th chapter, we, we pick up the story of, of Martha and Mary and their brother Lazarus. Sometime later, this is very close to the end of Jesus' life, this, this portion from John. And we read that a, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, the sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. And then John tells us in the next 13 verses of things Jesus did before leaving and coming to the town of Bethany where Lazarus and Martha and Mary lived, that he didn't leave immediately but did things and then finally left. And then we pick up the story in verse 17 of John 11. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days, that is, Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. <clears throat> Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, 
Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against, us, against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. <clears throat> Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench. For he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your son is our life, and I pray, Father, that we will honor him. And I pray, Father, that everyone here this morning will understand his words and seek to claim what he has here offered and receive the gift that was given to Lazarus and Martha and Mary and that is promised to all who believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Bible records two conversations between Jesus and Martha, the sister of Mary, the sister of Lazarus. The first of the two conversations between Jesus and Martha had to be frustrating, at least to Martha and no doubt to Jesus as well. Martha came to Jesus. He had stopped by her home on his way through the area. No doubt there was a retinue a group of people accompanied him, his 12, and there were others often as well. We would have to think that there's at least a dozen, maybe as many as two dozen people with him that have come. And Martha is taking care of preparations. She's alone. She's not being helped by her sister Mary, who is at the feet of Jesus, and she's unhappy about it. And so she complains to Jesus about Mary asking Jesus to have her come, saying to Jesus, make her help me in the kitchen. And it's an appeal that Jesus denied, not with an easy no, but with a denial that was with prejudice, which means don't even think about bringing this up again. Denied with prejudice, no, absolutely not. Not only refusing the request of Martha, but condemning it. Now, of course, it's possible that Martha did not really want help, that what she really wanted was appreciation, a call out from Christ, an attaboy, oh, you're doing so great, Martha, you're doing well, thanks so much. But her words, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone, suggest the possibility not just of resentment in Martha of Mary, but actually, there seems to be a a hidden indictment of Christ himself, at least the hint of it. Her complaint seems to carry the self-righteous tone of a woman who will do the right thing, a passive-aggressive person who wants the whole world to know that she alone knows what to be done, needs to be done, and is committed to doing the right thing, though everyone else fail around her. And yet it's hard for most of us not to leave this story somewhat sympathetic to Martha 
and somewhat scandalized by Mary, and most of all, somewhat shocked by what Jesus says to Martha in his response. And the reason that it is kind of shocking, and the reason that it is hard not to be scandalized is that Martha is actually doing the necessary thing. She's tackling the need, responding to the problem. Now, Luke does seem to imply that there was more than simple service going on with Martha. In verse 40, we read, now Martha was distracted with all her preparations, but the Greek that Luke literally wrote says, Martha was distracted with her much service, suggesting a whole lot of serving going on. But two dozen people out of the blue in your house, it seems like there's reason for a great deal of serving and a lot of distraction. Now we must be clear that Jesus is not denigrating service here. When Mary anoints Jesus' feet with perfume, he commends that act. When the sister who's at his feet at some point gets the, the, the jar of precious perfume and pours it out on his feet and the disciples complain and say, this is a waste, Jesus says, no, she has prepared me for burial. What she has done will be remembered wherever the gospel is told. And so he commends Mary for her act of service, saying that she had done it in preparation for his death and that it will be remembered <coughs> wherever he is known. Nor does Jesus himself shy away from serving <coughs> in the upper room when he washes his disciples' feet over Peter's objection. He is serving. And Peter is saying, no, but Jesus says, if you won't have me serve you, you will not have me at all. So this rebuke of Martha it's no justification of selfishness. It's no statement that it's better to sit than to serve. This is not a statement that we should all be looking to live a life of contemplation where we just sit at the feet of Jesus and never do anything, the life of a monastery perhaps or of a nunnery. Nothing is, is being said by Jesus here that makes a life that does not accomplish anything, that does not do work a better life than the life that works. And yet this is a rebuke. Perhaps one of the two most significant rebukes Jesus delivers in all of the, the Gospels. Probably the only one that is equal to it in being a hard one is the one when Jesus said to Peter, get away from me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of man, of God, but of man. And two very dear friends of his, both of them slammed by Jesus. Martha is slammed here. She is told in no uncertain terms that she is deficient, that she has fallen short. There are two parts to this rebuke, two statements by Christ that lie at the center of it. First, Jesus tells Martha she is worried and disturbed by many things, but only one thing is necessary. That is not an attack on service, but it is an attack on worry. Martha has many things she is concerned with. And Jesus says to her, only one thing is necessary. Now I want to say to you, many of you are planning your dinner for later today. You have schedules, deadlines, you're hoping that your stove turns on or turns off at the right time. You're thinking, you're preparing, you're being, in a sense, in the position of Martha. You're worried about it, your mind is, is running ahead, and you're saying, ah, I've got to make sure I get this done. Can you imagine Jesus saying, do you stop it? Seems eminently logical, necessary even, right? Why on earth would Jesus say to this woman, only one thing is necessary? In fact, how on earth can one thing be necessary? Is it really possible for only one thing to be necessary in the whole world? This is what Jesus says. Only one thing is necessary. You don't need 
your oven to turn on at the right time. You don't need the chairs from your kids' home to fit, to fit everyone around your table. You don't need to have the food baked or cooked perfectly. You don't even need to have the food. You need one thing, Jesus says. And there we go, oh, come on, Jesus, do you really mean it? Jesus says to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. How many mothers here this morning is Jesus speaking to when he says this? How many of us are weighed down by anxiety? How many of us have dipped our toes into the, into the toxic pool of anxiety that is, that is fomented by so much of modern life? How many of us are comparing ourselves with others on social media and finding ourselves wanting? Too many flawless bodies on Instagram, too many mommy bloggers who make every day for their family look like another day in paradise, all the children beautiful, all the houses large, perfectly decorated, and meanwhile, you're worried about whether you're going to lose weight from the last baby, and whether your husband is wishing he'd married a more put-together woman, and you're concerned that your children aren't going to love you if you discipline them too much, but you're also worried about looking like a weak mother by not disciplining, and everywhere you go, there's another worry and another anxiety, and the need for anti-anxiety medicine is taking our nation by storm. It's an epidemic with our children, and especially our daughters, facing it ever earlier in schools. And men, you may not think that you fight anxiety, but you fight its male equivalent, frustration, a desire for control, the desire to have your house look as though a guy who's competent owns it, not to be out of step with the neighbors on the lawn, how to pay for the new roof, what are we gonna do about the cracks in the driveway, can we get by with the roof for another two years or three years, the issues with the foundation, do we need to take care of it now, will there be enough in our retirement accounts to live on? Why are we not progressing at work in promotions like others? Then as well, worries over events that we have no control over. And so you're troubled men by events in Washington and you're unhappy about what's happened over the last year and you're concerned about the nation and its future and you're worried about the amount of money that the federal government is giving away and you're saying, oh my, this is going to bankrupt us. Your cars are wearing out, new cars are expensive, even used cars are dear, no longer cheap. You can, have, you can have your cars, but then you have to deal with the reality of a, a nation that is letting you drive your cars but not letting you speak your mind. Google and Facebook and Amazon censoring truth. And of course, the rise of China and the immigrants on the southern border, and you have worry after worry. Many of us are slaves to worry. We think we need to control the world, and we do it by our worries. And this is Martha, a control freak. She thinks she can force God onto her side in her worries, but he won't join her. Stop, Jesus says. No longer be worried. No longer be disturbed. But that's not all he says. He says a second and even more offensive thing by adding to Martha Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. Not only is he condemning Martha for her worries, but he's saying Mary has chosen better. Mary has received by turning to Jesus. In all her bustle, in all her concerns, and all her worries, Martha has lost and Mary has won a double blow. Not only is Mary not condemned by Christ, but Jesus commends Mary. What is the one thing? What is the one thing necessary? What is the one thing necessary rather than all these other worries and fears? Well, it's revealed in the next conversation between Jesus and Martha. The conversation, by the way, in which it seems that Martha has learned her lesson from the last conversation. This next conversation takes place later, much closer to Jesus' death. 
In John 11, we read that Lazarus, Mary and Martha's brother, has come down ill. The two sisters send word to Jesus, but he delays his departure for Bethany. When he arrives, Lazarus is dead, been buried for four days previously. The first person to, to greet him when he arrives in Bethany is Martha. Mary stays home. Martha runs out to meet him and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, that may sound like a rebuke, right? If you'd been here, if you hadn't dawdled, if you hadn't taken your time, my brother would not have died. And there may be a hint of asperity to it, a hint of rebuke. But it is a very different statement from her earlier complaint. Because listen to her next words. Her next words say, even now, even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Is that a rebuke of Jesus? Or is this a woman who's coming to understand the one thing that's necessary? Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus says to Mar Mary, to Martha, your, your brother will rise again. Now, that's not what Martha wants. It's not what she seeks. He's obviously speaking about the resurrection at the end of time. But she wants Lazarus right now. Not just in the resurrection of the last days. Yet she acknowledges the truth of what Jesus says. Even as she holds out for more. She responds, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So we come now to this great claim and statement by Christ. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. It's two different types of death there, isn't it? He who believes in me will live even if he dies. That's though he die physically, he will not die spiritually. And then he goes on and says, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And that's not a statement about physical death. That's a statement about the death of sin. That God will give life to everyone who lives and believes in Jesus and they will never die in the second death, the death that leads to judgment. So this is the one thing necessary. This is it right here. Martha, Jesus asks her, do you believe this? Do you believe this? You worrying father, you anxiety-filled mother, you young woman who thinks that the world is opposed to you and that you, you are alone and without recourse. You young guy who think that you don't know if you're gonna ever make what you wanna make of yourself. You who wonder if you'll ever know the happiness of marriage or if your children will ever grow up to know the Lord. Jesus is saying to you, do you believe this? Do you believe this? This is the word of Jesus. You need me, nothing more. Only one thing is necessary. You need me. Do you know this? I don't think that we can know this without coming to face the reality of death. Everything is, everything is important until nothing's important because of death. Everything is important in life until life is at an end. And then only one thing is important and that's Christ. I want, I want you to know
that what Jesus has said here is true. That there is only one thing that is necessary, and that is Jesus. You don't need anything but Jesus. And if you have Jesus, you have everything. Death itself has no power against you. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus says. And in the blazing glory of that statement, every worry and concern of your life and mine falls into a tawdry little bundle of dust. Because God will do what Jesus asks him to do. And Jesus has given himself for you. Really, the desire of my life for you, for my children, for this church is not growth in numbers, is not a nice building, is not anything that would be seen as a worldly accomplishment. And I hate myself when I give in to those things and seek them. The desire of my life is that we may know Jesus and that we may be filled with him.